receive this greeting that comes from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. To the church of God in Corinth or at Bridalwood, whether those gathered in person or those online, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' reconciling work on the cross makes it possible for us to come to the Father. And the Holy Spirit is at work in us so that we will fulfill our calling to be God's holy people. We are gathered in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And our welcome today reminds us that we join God's people, all those who call on the name of, of our Lord Jesus Christ in faithful worship. So receive this invitation from Jesus as we gather today. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As we gather, listen to Jesus' invitation and then welcome him to bind our wandering hearts to him, to take our hearts and seal them, and to tune our hearts to sing his grace. Worship is a work of the heart that is hard work, but the good news is that Jesus has done all of the heavy lifting. Come and find rest. As you are able, let me invite you to stand as we sing together. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing your grace. together 
to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Sing in the name of the Father. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace, hear the joyful sound of our offering, as your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with sing through and pray from Psalm 8. The reminder that God is uh, Lord over uh, heaven and earth, that his name is majestic in all the earth, that is, he has set his glory above the heavens. And as we've been doing, we'll sing through a portion of it and then read and pray together, and then continue to sing and read and pray together. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, we sing your praise. Oh Lord, our Lord, in the heavens you have set your glory, Lord. Oh Lord, we sing your praise. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name.
majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them, Majestic is your name in all the earth. Our Lord, we sing your praise, O oh Lord. Our Lord, in the heavens you have set your glory, Lord. Our oh Lord, we sing your praise, O oh made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Our Lord, we sing your praise. Oh Lord, our Lord, in the heavens you have set your glory. Jesus Christ and declare his lordship. This is perhaps the simplest and most direct affirmation of our faith, proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord. And yet we often struggle to submit areas of our lives to Christ's lordship. And so in our humility, we confess. Now, because we bring our confession from a place of humility, it's sometimes helpful to adopt a posture that affirms our response. You may want to bow your head, close your eyes, even bow your hands or kneel if you have the space to do so. Let's pray together. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, and forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. And in the stillness, we bring our own confessions to you. Lord, show us the areas of our lives where we are in fact reluctant to trust you so that we can surrender them to you in faithful obedience. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior, 
Amen. If you happen to have knelt or sat or bowed your hands, you're invited to stand as you are able. And again, letting our physical postures reinforce both that place or position of humility, but also our confidence in the presence of Christ. So as you are able, let me invite you to stand. We indeed pray for our hearts to be tuned to God's grace. We sing, our God saves. And the psalmist reminds us that with God, there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve God. Hear the good news. Through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. So receive this gift of God's reconciliation, even as you are called to this ministry of reconciliation. Receive this gift and share it. Take this opportunity. Those who are in the sanctuary can wave, thumbs up, peace signs as you greet each other and pass the peace of Christ. And those who are online, you're welcome to open up your microphones as you greet one another and pass the peace of Christ. Peace of Christ, everybody. Shalom, Peace Christ. everybody. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ, everyone. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ, everyone. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ.
Welcome all of you today. It's good to see you. Uh, as you've been informed, we'll be starting our uh, preaching series from the first letter of Corinthians. And so if you have your scripture with you, please turn with me uh, to the first letter of Corinthians chapter one. Reading from first Corinthians chapter one, verses one to nine. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and a brother, Sosthenes, uh, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him, you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. Uh, this is God's word for us uh, this morning. Friends, uh, will you bow down and uh, bow in prayer with me at this time as we uh, seek the Lord uh, and for his understanding as we continue to hear for his word this morning. Let's pray together. God, a word and wisdom, reveal the mysteries of faith to us this day by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the scriptures, show us how to witness to the name of Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. Well, friends, I want to start something uh, funny with you to this morning. Uh, there's an often joke told about Hillary and Bill Clinton. Uh, for those of you who are not, uh, who don't remember, Bill Clinton used to be the president of the United States, and uh, Hillary was also running for a candidate, right? Well, the story goes like this. A couple are driving along uh, when they stop to get some gas, and it turns out the attendant is a high school boyfriend of Hillary's. Uh, that's an interesting encounter, right? Well, as they're pulling away... Bill Clinton looks to Hillary and says, hey, just think, you know, if you had married him, today you would be a gas station attendant's wife. <laughs> Hillary shakes her head and says, no, Bill, you got it all wrong. If I had married him today, he would be the president of the United States. <laughs> um, it's, it's a matter of perspective, isn't it? Um, but, you know, how we think uh, and how we view the world uh, and what we actually believe, it matters. Truth matters. 
And, and so uh, it doesn't matter that we're sincere in what we believe. Uh, and I know there are many people who are very sincere. Uh, as a matter of fact, this week, uh, Kathy and I, we were watching uh, that documentary on Netflix uh, about the the fundamental uh, the uh, Latter-day Saints uh, movement with the... Uh, um, uh, with Jeff's uh, in you know uh, in Utah and uh, I guess the the temple that they build in Texas and it's scary, but if you see people from the cults, um, they're very sincere, very sincere. Sometimes I think more sincere than many of us in the church who've become lukewarm in their faith. But what's the problem? They're very sincere, but what they believe and the perspective that they have. It's not the truth, right? And, and so what we do believe is very, very important. And so the letter of 1 Corinthians is going to be a really great book for us uh, to make sure that the faith we hold on to, the perspective that we have of who God is, uh, to have the perspective of what it means to be believers in this fallen world, um, First Corinthians will be a great book to look at. Uh, for those of you who've uh, been reading the pastor's email that I sent out on Friday, you would have seen a link that I sent out, a visit to Corinth link to a video that you can find on YouTube. I, I think it's a great video and that's a really good background and uh, of uh, Corinth, uh, the ancient Corinth when the Apostle Paul wrote that letter. And so, you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, how much is a video worth? Um, I, but I feel the video that he did, did a really excellent job. Uh, and, and so, if you do have a chance, please do take a look. Um, but on that note, uh, as I just set up this letter for you, 1 Corinthians, in many ways, Apostle Paul writing to a church who's riddled with so many problems. There's divisions. Uh, people are talking about, like, groupies almost, about who their favorite speaker is. Some people believe the Apostle Paul is the one who speaks more powerfully into their uh, church. And some say, no, it's Apollos. No, some we say we follow Cephas. And others say, no, we follow Jesus uh, to even to, you know, kind of uh, show up the other people that their faith is even stronger. Uh, there's much immorality happening in this community. Uh, there's lawsuits happening amongst uh, believers. Um, I don't believe there's been any lawsuits against fellow brother here at uh, Bridal, has there? I, I hope not, and I hope that never happens, right? Uh, there's issues about marriage, food sacrifice to idols. Uh, apostle Paul has to tell them his right as an apostle because some of them are not questioning him. Um, order of worship. Uh, even the way they celebrate the Lord's Supper, their spiritual gift, just to name a few. Uh, so this church that Paul wrote to uh, was just filled with so many struggles and problems and divisions. And, and so if you're an Apostle Paul writing a letter to a church such as the church in Corinth, how would you feel? Uh, you know, and, and, and Corinth, for those of you who watched the video and know a little bit, it was one of the most important cities in the Roman empires back then. Uh, it just held a great place in terms of geography, uh, that when there was goods uh, uh, passing through uh, the ancient Roman empire, Corinth was one of those places that was like a land bridge and uh, people had to go through that in order to get the goods to the rest of Europe from Africa or Asia Minor. And so it played a really strategic role. And as a result, it was a cosmopolitan that brought people from many different backgrounds. And, and so even at a societal level, it was very difficult for people to agree upon any culture or any religion uh, background as one ultimate truth for everybody. It was just a cosmopolitan, and only rule was that you don't judge others. Let others be. And, and there's so many different gods that they worshipped in Corinth, uh, so many different kind of temples, uh, different cultures that was available, different languages spoken. It truly was a cosmopolitan, very similar to what Toronto is. And so for people to hold on to an absolute truth and to continue to 
confess and witness that there is only one true God. Uh, in a place of marketplace where there's so many options, uh, that was a difficult position to hold. Uh, and, and so Apostle Paul knew the challenges that there was at a societal level uh, where Corinth was filled with many riches, many uh, other options that was available to the people. And the church was competing with all these uh, oppositions and other temptations, um, like just like today. Uh, and there's so many options out there, uh, but it is to this church that Paul speaks. And goodness, as an apostle and a leader of the church, thinking about the church in Corinth, uh, you might wonder, where do I start? Uh, and maybe the problems seem just too big and, and felt that the battle was already over. But Apostle Paul, as he writes to the church in Corinth, maybe gives us a master class to all the believers how we are to deal with challenges uh, in our lives. First of all, when Paul writes uh, in verse 1, he says, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ, uh, Jesus by the will of God. Paul did didn't see himself as a citizen of this world or of Corinth or the Roman Empire first, but he saw himself as one who was sent by Christ Jesus, meaning he was someone under the authority of Jesus Christ. More than anything else, Paul saw himself as a citizen of God's kingdom before anything else. Yes, some of us here living here are Trontonians. I see a sister joining us from London, uh, from Florida. And so we all belong somewhere, and we're citizens of a certain city, a province, a, a state, a country. Uh, but Paul, first and foremost, he didn't see himself as a Choi or a Smith or a, or a Wong, but he saw himself as someone who belonged to God first. And that's where his North Star, or, or that's where his perspective all started. Things all started with God. And it was by the will of God that Paul was sent to the church in Corinth. Imagine if you can have that kind of perspective, that whenever a challenge comes along, that you don't keep saying, why God, why me? Any of you ever do that? We have a mass confession here. Why me, oh God? How does that work out? Do you ever find any solution or headway by keep asking, why me? Why me? Right? Well, perhaps you ever ask the question, why not me? Right? You know, we always ask the problems or the question of why is there evil in the world? But do we ever to the same degree, ask question, why is there goodness in the world? Right? We complain a lot when bad things happen, but you ever complain to God, God, it's not fair. Why are you so good to me? Right? God, why do I have so many things? It's not fair. You ever complain to God about all the goodness that you have in life? So it's kind of a different perspective, isn't it? I mean, the fact of the matter is, if we didn't have life itself, we wouldn't be even able to complain, right? So the fact that we have life, that we can experience the highs and the lows, the challenges as well as the blessings, uh, we do need to keep things in perspective. And, and so one of the things that we know about Paul is, number one, is that he is God-centered uh, in everything that he looks at. And so Apostle Paul, in a similar way, as he's addressing the church in Corinth, he doesn't say, oh, you troublemakers, oh, why you? You know, uh, he doesn't think about why are you so foolish and why are you doing this? But he looks at the people in Corinth and says, look, the church of God in Corinth, who do they belong to? They belong to God. Just as Apostle Paul belongs uh, to God, he also knows that they are belong, uh, they also belong to God. And he says, look, you have been sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere, everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord, uh, their God, their Lord and ours. Uh, 
And so Apostle Paul not only saw the people in Corinth as just people of Corinth, but in, in the people of Corinth, in the church of Corinth, he saw the one who was their Lord, their God, the one who has sanctified them, the one who has called them to be holy. He saw the, in the people of Corinth, ridden with so many troubles and challenges, he saw the God of the people of Corinth. And I think it's always important for us to see that. As you continue in your relationships with people at home, at workplace, uh, in all your social circles, I find even tennis clubs have problems. You know, people say politics, right? But that's everywhere. You know, they talk, complain about politics, even at hospital. Uh, even all these organizations that are there to do good and perhaps not supposed to be the most profit-driven places, but even there where there is people, there are trouble and people complain about politics and all the uh, wrongdoings that goes on. But what Apostle Paul is doing is that he's not only seeing the people, he's seeing uh, the God who is the God of those troubled people. Uh, there are no perfect people in the world. And so instead of seeing just their troubles only, uh, he saw the God uh, who is the God of those people that are ridden with trouble. And so it's good for us to make sure that when we are dealing with people in our family, uh, whether it be your children, your siblings, even your parents, uh, and maybe your friends, fellow students, coworkers, always to look up and not only see for who they are, but to see the God who is God of them, whether they know it or not, and to see what is God doing in their midst. And, and so this is really important uh, to see things and to see people uh, from God's perspective. And in Paul's greeting, it reveals to us what is most important to Paul as he sees the people. He says, grace and peace to you from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, who is Christ? He's a savior, right? And so even the greeting grace and peace, well, what is the grace? Grace is that gift undeserving that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and paid the price that we couldn't pay. And that's grace. Uh, that God has given to us. And Paul offers that in his greeting. And the peace, similarly, what is that peace? Well, people who did not have the peace with God before, people who were far away, people whose relationship with God was broken before because of the gospel, they can now approach God without fear, but with peace. Uh, that the relationship that was broken with God is now fixed. And so, friends, we see from Paul in this master class that he sees the church in Corinth, and he's not denying the reality of the problems that exist in Corinth. He doesn't just swipe it under the carpet. And you'll see it as you continue to read the letter as Paul deals with one problem after another problem after another problem uh, that I've been stressing more, you know, continuously in our Bible studies to think of these problems like case studies. So Paul, as he deals with the problem in the church of Corinth, who did not have the New Testament scriptures like you and I, their problems has become a gift, like a case study that we can learn from their situation, because the struggles that they have is not too far from the struggles we have in our world as well. So number one, Paul was not denying the uh, reality and the troubles that they are. But instead, number one, Paul was God-centered. He not only saw for who they are, but Paul saw in the people of Corinth who they are called to be in Jesus Christ, who they can be, and who they will eventually become. You see, the people in Corinth, they didn't have a proper perspective as to who they were in Jesus Christ and what they were called to be. And so Apostle Paul needed to teach them and correct them. And similarly, when people asked you when you were younger what you want to become when you, 
you know, when you become older, how many different answers did you give until you finally found uh, what you, the, the career choice that you ultimately made? Uh, I kid you not, when I first came to Canada as a kid, uh, I was nine, just about to turn 10. And you know, when somebody asked me what I wanted to be in the future, you know what my answer was? I said, I want to become a transport truck driver. <laughs> Do you know why? Because Canada was so large, I wanted to drive everywhere and look and discover this new country and, you know, see all the beauties that Canada had to offer. And I thought, wow, that'd be great to become a transport a truck driver and uh, drive around and, you know, to visit all different places uh, in Canada. And that's what I wanted to do. And uh, if you asked me two years later, you know, what the answer I would have given you, I said, I wanted to become a baseball player. Two years later, if you asked me, I would have said I wanted to be a hockey player. And a year later, I would have said I want to become, uh, you know, a cyclist. And, uh, you know, a year later, if you asked me, I would have said I want to become a businessman. And so, you know, things really changed a lot until finally uh, I discovered, at least for me, my calling uh, from the Lord. And in the same way, the people in Corinth, they still had much to grow up. They didn't know. Uh, And they didn't understand who they were in Christ and what they are to become. So Paul needed to remind them, not only are you saved in Jesus Christ, but you are becoming sanctified to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And the divisions that you're displaying, the morality that you're displaying, that is not the character of Jesus Christ and the spirit that God has given you in the ways in which he is grooming you. And and so Apostle Paul was God-centered in how he viewed the people of Corinth, and he looked at them not only for who they are at the moment, but with great faith and love and patience, he saw in them what they can become in the future. So friends, it might be a good time to kind of pause to ask yourself, how do you see yourself today when you look in the mirror? Uh, When you see yourself, do you just see yourself as you are in you? Or do you also see in yourself and your circumstances how challenging it might be of who you are in Jesus Christ and who you are becoming in Jesus Christ? So it's so important. And If people have ever spoken to your life of who you are and what you can be in a very negative way, I I pray that God would heal uh, you and heal us uh, of that kind of negativity and instead replace it with the truth of the gospel and who we can uh, become in Christ and who we are in in Jesus Christ. And um, Apostle Paul uh, in verse 6, we also see his outlook. He says, because of our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you, uh, uh, therefore do not, you do not lack any spiritual guest, uh, gifts as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Um, so here, he says, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you, uh, he made sure that they were Uh, saved. And and so the issue here was not a salvation issue so much as sanctification issue or maturing issue. And and so know for certain that Christians, when they are saved, they're not mature all at once. They might have the joy of salvation, but there's still a lot of maturing process to do. And so many of us also need to realize that when we are saved, yes, we are saved from uh, our faults, our mistakes, and the sins that we have committed uh, in in this world. But when God saves us, it doesn't mean we're complete at the moment that we meet our Lord Jesus and accept him as our Lord and Savior. But there's a maturing process to do. And I think all of us agree the maturing process can be tiring. Uh, and it can be a long process. You know, a good reminder for me is I love those nature shows, and I think it's amazing 
that when you see, you know, things like wildebeest, you know, the deers, often the ones that are hunted by lions and other predators, how long does it take them to walk or to even run? Some of them, by the end of the day, they're already running. <laughs> but, you know, how long does it take for a human being uh, to run, let alone walk or even crawl? You know, it takes months and years before that takes place, right? Uh, and not only for our physical maturity uh, and the length that it takes, how much longer our spiritual and emotional and mental maturity to take place. And so we need to be patient and uh, we need to know that it is a gift, but that maturity, it takes a long time. Uh, friends, number three and lastly, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful as we are told in verse 9. Apostle Paul, the reason why he was able to have this kind of view in the midst of tremendous challenge and uh, the problems that uh, the Corinthians were facing, he says in verse 9, God who called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. Paul doesn't say people in Corinth is faithful. He doesn't say he is faithful. But who is he saying is faithful? He's saying that the God of Corinth is faithful. And because God is not finished with them, but the work that he has begun, that he is going to bring it to completion, that Paul is able to have this kind of perspective, that he, is, he knows that God is not finished with them. And so he not only saw the limitations of the people in Corinth, but he saw the possibilities of what might be possible in God's hands. And friends, perhaps this kind of gives us a little bit of perspective. You know, for us right now living in our Western world, Christianity doesn't have its place in our society like what it used to be. Uh, there was a time when politicians uh, used to, uh, you know, campaign, they needed to disclose that they belonged to a certain denomination, that they were a regular church attenders. And if they weren't, you know, people were most likely not to vote for them. But that's not how our Western world is today, is it? Talk of God doesn't show up anywhere. And for many matters, we have a society now where talks of God uh, and especially Christianity, you know, people don't want that anywhere in the marketplace. And a bunch of other ideologies uh, have become more acceptable. And uh, it's easy for us sometimes to think that we're under attack or maybe get on the offensive and start pointing the fingers at the people uh, that we see as problematic. And, you know, it's easy for us to just shun them, ignore them, and uh, avoid them altogether. But remember what Jesus did? In Gospel Luke, chapter 5, when Jesus calls Levi, uh, he becomes a guest at his house, and he is eating with a bunch of sinners, right? And it says in verse 30 in Luke chapter 5, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complain to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And what was Jesus' answer? He says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So, you know what Jesus would do today if he was here? He would go and be the companions Seek the company of the people that we like to avoid, right? The kind of people that, you know, maybe Christians wouldn't want to hang out with. That's exactly the people. That's exactly the place where we'll find Jesus. Why? Because Jesus came first and foremost as a savior. He came for the people who are broken. He came for the people who are confused, people who are lost, people who have become captive to the evil spirit. Jesus came so that he may heal, uh, that Jesus came by his kindness, that people would turn to God, repent, and be saved, and become part of God's 
kingdom. So friends, this is my call and challenge to you and to myself today. Jesus not only saw the limitations, but he saw the possibilities. And Apostle Paul, he has done the same with the people of Corinth because he saw not first the people of Corinth and their sins and their limitations, but God. God who is full of possibilities. And uh, that would also do us well today. I know um, it's easy for us to get into that place. God, why me? And we pray that, God, will you just take this problem away? But sometimes those problems don't disappear. But it seems like God is calling us to be faithful in the midst of that problem and to invite God into that situation and journey together with him and to see how he will mature us and how he will provide for us and continue to provide for us in the midst of that journey of challenge. And so I want to read for you a lyric uh, from the song, uh, God Will Make a Way by Don Moen. Uh, And I think that will do us well to view our challenges and our circumstances with a little different perspective. Uh, He writes in the song, God will make a way, you know, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works. He will be, he will be my guide, hold me closely to his side with love and strength for each new day. He will make a way, he will make a way. By roadway in the wilderness, he will lead me. Rivers in the desert will I see. Heaven and earth will fade, but his word will still remain. And he will do something new today. Oh, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. Friends, as God has made a way for Paul, for the people in Corinth, I trust God will also make a way for us where there seems to be no way. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it's our hope today that you would set our sights, our sights on you. Lord, you have called us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And uh, Lord, the old views that we have and the views that have been taught by the ways of this world Lord, is no longer useful for us. But Father, will you give us the mind of Christ, the mind of your spirit, that we may judge, that we may discern all things, not with our perspective, not with worldly perspective, but from your kingdom perspective, that we may wait on you and that we may anticipate and participate the ways in which your spirit is moving. So, Father, help us not to drag our heels or to work against you. But, Lord, will you give us a spirit that, Lord, is bold and a spirit that also conquers and overcomes all things, just as you have done, Lord, and that we will not succumb or to give up uh, in the challenges that we face. But, Father, we pray that our faith would be open and that faith would be bold to move together with you as we face and endure all challenges that come our way. So, Lord, we lift ourselves and our circumstances to you, and we ask that you would make a way as only you can. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you are able, let me invite you to stand. May we, as we have get, God has gathered us, may we be sent out with the knowledge, the assurance of Christ's love for us. And let's sing as we go. My faith has found a resting place.
Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him. He'll never cast me out. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died. is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other Jesus died and that he died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he My friends, my charge to you today is to go in confidence that God did not shun the people of Corinth with shortcomings, but he embraced them and he walked with them. And he also does the same for us. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Well, God bless you, everybody, and have a wonderful week.